Welcome to Mystery Us. I'm Tony Pratt, your host for Mystery Us. And on this edition of Mystery Us, our guest is Paul Von Ward. Paul is an interdisciplinary cosmologist and independent scholar who is the author of several books, including Our Solarian Legacy, God's Genes and Consciousness, and his latest work is The Soul Genome, Science and Reincarnation. Welcome to Mystery S, Paul. Thank you very much, How are you Tony. doing? I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, Paul, most of the ideas about reincarnation in the past have involved some kind of religious belief or concepts that are of a spiritual or mystical mm -hmm. nature. In your book, you explore the possibility that reincarnation could be a natural phenomena and universal aspect of Homo sapiens' physical and conscious evolution. What evidence led you to pursue a scientific explanation of reincarnation? Well, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence. And what I do in the book is I introduce a number of areas of evidence that I think support the notion of reincarnation mm -hmm. that most people don't think about in terms of reincarnation. Usually, as you mentioned in your introduction there, uh, people think of uh, reincarnation in terms of some ethereal spirit, the soul that somehow has uh, nothing to do with daily living but incarnates human beings at the time of birth or at the time of conception. Those beliefs vary. Right. And that somehow it comes in and the soul has an experience living through a human. In other words, the human is somehow different from the uh, soul okay. that was reincarnated. Uh, but about 50 years ago, a uh, psychiatrist at the University of Virginia named Ian Stevenson began to take a scientific approach and collect stories of children who alleged to have, uh, who were alleged to have uh, memories of previous mm -hmm. lives. And they, they knew things about people who'd lived before, they knew facts about locations, about uh, incidents that happened in the lives of these people who were now deceased. Sure. And uh, he found in India, in uh, Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe, and the United States, many cases, about 3,000, between 2,500 and 3,000 cases of people where these memories could actually be validated, meaning that the information that these children had uh, could be confirmed as reflecting events in the past. Right. Now, that doesn't prove reincarnation, okay. but it's suggestive of the lifetime in the past somehow transmitting into the present lifetime this information and knowledge. He also found uh, physical similarities between these children and their alleged previous lives. So this was the first real scientific effort to to gather data that was empirical, you had pictures, you had measurements, you had recordings, you had right. documents, all of these things that science can do something with. And uh, he died last year in 2007, but uh, some year before, some time before he died, he began to review all of this data that he had, all this information, and he said, mm -hmm. I've got all this evidence of this happened in the past, these people in the present know it, these people in the present resemble those people in the past, mm -hmm. what is the explanation? Yeah. And so his thought was, uh, maybe it's something like a container, and he used a Greek term called psychophore, a container that sort of carries it. Now, he didn't really have a lot of uh, experience with uh, some of the new areas of research in biology and physics, mm -hmm. which suggests that all physical organisms have these energetic patterns, have information right. that are in a field that is not physical, but mm -hmm. it, it accompanies uh, the physical uh, life of a person, the life of an insect, or some other species. All right. living species have this field. So as I began to do research on reincarnation, uh, to do a different kind of book some years ago, uh, I reread, I had met Ian 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago when he was doing the work back in the early 90s, I reread his work, and then I read some other books of cases of people who uh, had the same kind of evidence. And I found that in looking at all these cases, there were about five different categories of empirical information. Right. You could look at and identify it, evaluate it. I could look at it, a third party could look at it, and we could talk about it. Uh, these were not just memories or dreams or uh, 
ideas that came out of a hypnotic session mm -hmm. that only the person who had them could say, this is what I had. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that some of those memories and things aren't valid, but mm -hmm. you couldn't test them yourself. I couldn't test them. So I began to uh, calculate sort of the areas based on a lot of the best cases that are out there, and I found that there were a whole set, there was a whole set of physical <coughs> features that seemed to carry forward from the previous life to this lifetime. And there were physical, physical bodily features, characteristics. Bodily character. Well, okay. one of them we call uh, physical architecture, which really is the bone structure. Is this the biometrics? That the, the biometrics that I mentioned uh, in our earlier discussion. Uh, this is where scientists have found that the genetic uh, stability of certain things in our body seem to carry through the whole lifetime. Uh, despite changes in health and other conditions. That's the physical architecture, the way, you know, the proportions of our nose and eyes Not to and mention chin. different parents. I mean, you would think you would just have the characteristics you of your parents. You don't. You have general uh, resemblances in most cases, but what biometrics has done, where, and biometrics we might just mention, is what uh, uh, security firms now use to take a picture of your face and and have the picture in the computer and then if you show up at the the door and want to get into a secure location they compare your face and the picture of you in the computer mm -hmm. and they measure all these dimensions and say you look close enough to the picture in our computer we'll let you in the door right so I use that technology to measure faces of people I didn't use the computer technology because we were doing cases that involved people with photographs and portraits from previous lifetimes or old photographs that weren't digital in the previous lifetime. So you had the physical characteristics, not just the faces, but the body type, mm -hmm. the hair patterns, the ear forms, the hand finger proportions, uh, and uh, these characteristics along with voice mm -hmm. uh, seem to be stable. Finger types, the color of your eyes, what race you are, which sex you are, may seem may change or seems to change hmm. from these past lives to the present ones. Then we looked at the mental uh, factor, the way we think, how we analyze, how we uh, synthesize information, uh, what we do about information that we have. That's a whole pattern. And you can use psychological IQ tests and other tests to compare uh, past lives and present lives. There was a great deal of correspondence in my strong cases. Same thing about emotions. Same thing about the way we interact with other people. You know, the extrovert, introvert uh, dichotomy mm -hmm. uh, in emotions, the person who's anxious all the time or the person who's calm all the time. In other words, you evaluate people on all these factors and compare the previous life to this life. And the strongest cases we had uh, in our pilot study Mm -hmm. uh, which we have been conducting for the last couple of years and are now going to continue with other cases and new cases from the public. Right. Uh, you have evidence that anyone can look at and say, this person seems more like that person who lived 100 years ago or 50 years ago mm -hmm. than anybody else who's living today. And so that degree of correspondence uh, is pretty powerful evidence that there's some sort of carry forward. Right. And I call it the psychoplasm. It's a little bit uh, different from Stevenson's term. Psycho four. Psycho four was container. Right. But th it's more than a container. It, it's your physical uh, DNA, the mm -hmm. genotype. It's your memories. It's your knowledge. It's your emotional state, your emotional predispositions. Uh, all of these things that make us a real piece, a real person. I right. call it the uh, the whole package. <laughs> okay, so you call this model the psychoplasm model of information and energetic patterns, and this this is what acts as the mechanism for transferring past life learning and adaptations. Absolutely. In other words, it's but how does that how does that work though? Well, it's it, that's a big mystery. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're on okay. your mystery. Mysterious. Mysterious yeah. uh, well, it's it's I I compare it to the uh, physics mystery of black holes. Okay. In other words, physicists, astronomers, all of the scientists who are studying these phenomena, they look into the darkness of space and they say, we see something going into a part, a point in space, 
It looks as if matter is being destroyed, eaten up. We see coming out of that flares of light, radiation. Uh, so they see what's going in and what's coming out. Right. And the only way to explain it is something like a black hole. Right. And they say the black hole then must act in this particular way. So what I'm saying is the psychoplasm is in uh, this uh, field of reincarnation studies. Uh, you, you, we don't know exactly how it works. Right. But we know that it produces these effects. The effects, yeah. And you, so you have a cause, a past, a mechanism, and the effect. Now, I use the word uh, psychoplasm simultaneously with the term soul genome. Mm -hmm. Because I think what we're talking about is a scientific, uh, down-to-earth notion of what people have called soul in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason they don't have a very good definition of what the soul is is because we haven't really studied how it works in our own human down-to-earth lifetimes. Right. And what I'm trying to do is to bring that, as I said, uh, this notion, heavenly notion, down to earth. Because yeah. if it's real, you know, it affects all of us. All of us have had uh, this aspect of evolution and reincarnation in our own uh, birth and development. And uh, hopefully uh, the predisposition and the legacy we have from a previous life uh, will be uh, improved by our right. education, learning, experience that we pass on to the next generation. Okay, now you have a thing called the Reincarnation Experiment, and it's at www.reincarnationexperiment.org. Now, what is that all about? Well, this is a website. Uh, first of all, I've, you know, we published the book uh, which mm -hmm. describes the pilot study. I have a lot of cases in the book that describe people living today mm -hmm. that we strongly believe if reincarnation is real, those people living today are the most likely reincarnations of individuals that we've identified in the past. Some of them are historical figures, well-known figures. Uh, Marilyn Monroe is one right. of them. James Madison, our fourth president, is another one. Uh, one is a Navy uh, seaman who died in a crash uh, in 1933, uh, who's now a Navy captain uh, in, in this lifetime. We have a lot of cases that are of different types uh, to suggest this. So if those cases are real, uh, we want to explain it to the public and the website, and we want to invite other people uh, who may have never seen a psychic, never seen a psychologist, never been a part of any study like this, but they have memories, they have uh, habits that their mm -hmm. parents tell them reflect the habits of an ancestor, yeah. Uh, any kind of connection that people I might have. I it, know it, it uh, builds a lot of interest for people when, it, when it's uh, some historical figure or famous person from the past, but why is there so much focus uh, given on those cases? Is it just because you have more information about them? Well, or? that's exactly the accurate okay. question. In, in, in our pilot study, we had some ordinary people who, who have no uh, you know, big public uh, uh, resume that uh, everybody knows about, and they had some past lives that are, uh, you know, a soldier in the Confederate uh, uh, right. Army during the Civil War. So the vast majority are not known figures. They're, they're not known they figures. Couldn't be, obviously. Couldn't be. Yeah. And, and so what we do, though, to prove the model, you need to have information. You need to have some portraits or images of them. And mm -hmm. those were people who were fairly well known or fairly well off in a previous lifetime. You have to know something about the way they think and so on. They have to have written something or other people might have written something about them. Or they could have been an artist that painted or, or a musician that composed uh, music or, or wrote lyrics. Uh, in other words, to have some information that uh, could be considered uh, accurate uh, evidence mm -hmm. of how that person lived and worked and what yeah. he or she was capable of doing. So. We took the famous cases because we've got a lot to compare. Yeah. And then that proves then, though, this symmetry between the lifetimes. What right. we can do with a person who's never even thought about a previous life is to look at the way we are now in terms of how we grew up as children, what our physical features are, the mm -hmm. way we thought of ourselves at a very young age, the kinds of things we did as a young person before we got 
uh, too much into doing things the way the current society does it. Right. And you can, you can uh, develop a profile or a picture of what that legacy mm -hmm. is from the previous life. Right. And then with hints of suggestions of possible names, and we, we've got a number of people who've, who've had their own sort of sense. Well, mm -hmm. I, I feel close to that person. Yeah. It could be a relative, it could be someone you've never known, it could be only a kind of person. But that starts the research. And w with about six billion people on Earth, uh, and I've heard, heard it said that that's more people than have ever lived in human history. <laughs> right. So <laughs> where, how did, where, where did they reincarnate from if there's no, or, or are there people elsewhere that we don't know about? Right. Well, <laughs> well if you think, if you, uh, there could be people elsewhere. Uh, that's, another, that's another topic. But uh, first of all, it's, it's an assumption to say that uh, this, this number of people have not lived before. Right. Because we don't know how many people lived before the cataclysm, the flood of, we don't know how many cavemen there were, right? <laughs> well, we don't know how many people lived before that time and mm -hmm. after the cataclysm about 11,500 years ago. You had only survivors. So we had mm -hmm. small groups of tribes and people around the world. Right. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, stories of civilizations prior to this period. I mean, Atlantis and others, and I don't want to get into that discussion at this point. Right. But we really, I it's a it's an argument that doesn't hold up given that we don't really know what the past has been. Yeah. So I, I think that, and also when you look at the fact of reincarnation, uh, you have uh, an evolving process uh, in all species. Mm -hmm. And if it happens in all species, there is some way of, of uh, we, we, we divide our DNA, we divide our learning, we pass it on to new physical beings mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, you continue this legacy, this uh, evolutionary, what I call, a, it's the evolutionary conservation of consciousness, of knowledge and experience and knowing. Just like uh, you can't in uh, physics, you can have energy and matter and you can't destroy either one, you can change it from one form to the other. Right. Well, I would argue that consciousness is the same way. You you can't really destroy it. It's either incarnate in the physical uh, realm or it is uh, disincarnate in another dimension, in a more ethereal dimension. So, uh, so is this quantum physics? Is that the model that kind of explain could could explain? Well, quantum quantum physics is uh, supportive of this notion because quantum physics, first of all, tells us that everything fundamentally is energetic and information. Mm -hmm. And so that what we consider to be a physical incarnation of an organism is right. really composed of quanta of energy right. that flash in and out of existence. And so I don't want to say it's exactly the same thing, but I would say for the soul genome or the psychoplasm, uh, it's like uh, a particle. Uh, the particle may be a wave of light or uh, an energy wave, an electromagnetic wave, or some wave that's not electromagnetic. And then in quantum physics, it manifests as a particle uh, in a moment in time and place. And I would suggest that if you think in terms of, as we seem to know from studying nature, as above, so below, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> the same sort of model, it seems to me, can apply to the notion of the, the soul genome or the psychoplasm. So w did the book almost be titled uh, Psychoplasm? <laughs> Was that a close second? Well, or? I, 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 <laughs> I didn't want to use psychoplasm because that's a Everybody knew what soul was. That's a yeah. scientific uh, yeah. term uh, that suggests this sort of mechanism that I've talked about. <coughs> Excuse me. But the soul genome, the soul is not usually connected in the public's mind with the genome, because the genome is usually thought of as a physical uh, set of you know DNA that we get transmitted from our parents and so on. Uh, but by tying the two together, we're suggesting that the genome itself is more than just physical bits of DNA yeah. and their chemistry. It's energetic patterns, it's information patterns, and that's where you get to the cutting edge of biology. Biology now is 
uh, people who are on the cutting edge of research in biology are thinking mm -hmm. of themselves as information system analysts because what we've discovered is it's the information yeah. that shapes the evolution of bacteria, fruit flies, caterpillars to okay, butterflies, of, et cetera. Of, uh, other organisms. Is uh, transmigration of the soul part of this process? Is, do animals reincarnate? Well, uh, I would say that all living organisms reincarnate in the sense that we're talking about here. The term transmigration, uh, in the traditional use of that term several thousand years ago in its original connotation was that humans could go from one species to the other, back and forth. I don't think that's necessarily the case that we're discovering at this point in time. Uh, I think that uh, it's within a species, it's species consciousness, but that's, it's speculative. But I, I think that we have evidence that learning and adaptation, which takes part in one generation of insects and animals, can be perceived in the next generation, just as we see in humans. For example, let's take uh, great uh, musician uh, Mozart. Uh, many of us think there was another person who is likely the reincarnation, a guy named Korn Gold, who is a very well-known uh, uh, later uh, composer and uh, uh, musician, and uh, people who look at their lives see... Isn't his name Wolfgang also? His middle name is Wolfgang <laughs> also, that's right, <laughs> interestingly enough. And there was no conscious effort, as far as we yeah. know, to make that connection, because the kid was named before they even knew he was a musician. Uh, but you see this, and I wor worked with a case of Paul Gauguin, a famous painter, and uh, his uh, likely reincarnation in this lifetime, uh, Peter uh, T. Camp, and you see progress yes. in the learning. So when we look at animals and we look at insects, we can see the same progress. Uh, scientists are able to teach caterpillars to react to a certain stimulus, uh, and then when all of that turns into soup and then becomes a butterfly, the butterfly will react to the same stimulus as the caterpillar was taught. So, anyhow, uh, that's, it's still very speculative, but I yeah. think that there's some basis in evidence that uh, it's a natural part of the living order. So even plants have to have some kind of <laughs> Maybe. connection. Like I know there's these, these little red berries that you see alongside the road and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, there's only a couple of birds that can even chew them up to where the seeds inside because normally they'll, they'll drop the seeds right. and spread it around that's why it's everywhere right and it connects to a lot of different kind of plants but even the birds that totally chew it up till it's disintegrated mm -hmm. digest it it reassembles and still grows that's right so. this is where biology comes in with the notion that what you have are patterns mm -hmm. and just before uh, actually the book came out uh, I read research about uh, physicists looking in space using our space uh, station, mm -hmm. to th th they observe space dust in a vacuum, reconforming itself, refiguring itself in certain patterns, mm -hmm. which one of those patterns happened to be the helix, yes. the same as our DNA, DNA. Uh, 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 helix. Uh, another study that was done was uh, uh, taking uh, plasma, just simply uh, plasma gases, stirring them up and allegedly breaking up all the patterns that were there, mm -hmm. they reformed. So what this research in physics and biology suggests is that the idea, this goes back to Plato, you remember he said the idea is inside everything and it's right. the ideal, it's the perfect uh, pattern. Well, people are discovering that that seems to be the case. And what I would suggest is that what we've thought of as reincarnation is the effect of that process. And we have a lot of cases that I don't think can be explained any other way. I mean, you're talking about knowledge, habits, physical patterns, ways of thinking, ways of behaving, all of these things we've talked about. Uh, to say that this person matches so perfectly that person a hundred years ago without 
hypothesizing some kind of connection. Right. Which is not genetic. Got to be a cause and effect there. Yeah. I mean, you've got a cause and effect, and you have to hypothesize a mechanism in the middle somewhere. And uh, other ideas of, you know, there are some, like, people are just tapping into memories of dead people, you know. Yeah. Or people are tapping into ideas that are out in the collective unconscious or the Akashic records. Right. Or uh, maybe uh, some spirit invaded this person and, and uh, uh is the spirit of that person. Well, Pos they're possessed by they're the possessed. dead person, yeah. So, so, you know, I mean, those are even more speculative, it seems to me, because mm -hmm. they require some third party uh, action, whereas the natural process of reincarnation doesn't require a third party uh, hypothesis, which is even more difficult to prove. I think it's easier to prove that there's some sort of natural mechanism involved. Right. Or, or you can't prove it, but it's it's. Now, Paul, like your uh, your book is called the Soul Genome Subheading: A Science and Reincarnation. That's right. And so you're basically re uh, reconcil reconciling reincarnation with a scientific theory That's of how it works. Um, now, is this available on Amazon.com? Oh, yeah. It's Amazon.com. And your, com your and website is www.vonward.com. Right. And if people want to contact you by email, it is paul at vonward.com. Very easy. Pretty simple. Yeah, pretty simple. Okay. Because just remember, Paul Von Ward and manipulate it. You can communicate either way. And we're gonna we're gonna do a, a follow up show here in the near future uh, about your book, God's Genes and Consciousness, where we're gonna discuss advanced beings mm -hmm. and visitations uh, from. Uh, possibly some of those other people out there that we may be reincarnating from. Well, the advanced beings include, you know, possible other beings, also uh, what we call angels and gods and other ethereal beings. So it's a rich area for discussion. Well, Paul, it's been a pleasure to have you on Mystery Us. Thank you for being our guest. It's a pleasure being with you. Enjoyed it. Yes, enjoyed it. Thanks. Tom.